I am sure. So our feature presenter is Jack O'Burns, professor of astrophysics. And, and all I did was take like the first line on this. Here's Jack's bio. Let me just say that Jack is impressively qualified to give tonight's talk. And, and it's about human robotic exploration of the moon and beyond, inspired by Silicon Valley entrepreneur, uh, computer commercial space company. So this would be really, really cool. Um, NASA, Orion, and space launch systems, along with rockets and landers by SpaceX and Blue Origin. The moon and Mars explored via governmental programs, international partnerships, and even public-private partnership. The telerobotics, lunar gateway in orbit, rovers, telescopes on the lunar surface, synergies between robots and humans. This presentation has it all. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and let Jack share his. Well, thank you, Joe. Um, I'm putting up my slides now. Can you all, I'm going to put it in presentation mode. Can you all see my slides? Yes. yes. Great. Well, thanks. It's great to be with you. I was telling Joe earlier that um, it's a little bit of a homecoming because I grew up not too far from uh, the New Hampshire border uh, in um, central, north central Massachusetts, a little town called Shirley, which is near uh, Lemonster and Fitchburg. So um, spent a lot of years there, did uh, my initial um, astronomy, amateur astronomy experience uh, in some of the clubs there. But uh, today what I'm gonna do is talk about some work that um, we've been doing in terms of preparing for NASA's uh, new missions to the moon. This year, we're going to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the last time human astronauts left Earth orbit. And that was on the Apollo 17 mission, uh, which uh, was launched in December of 1972. It's hard to believe, but it's been 50 years since we've been to the moon, since we've even left Earth orbit. Um, but this new moon program that I'm gonna tell you about, this is not your grandfather's Apollo program. This is one that is going to take advantage of 50 years worth of technology development that has taken place, not just in the development of rockets and spacecraft, but also in artificial intelligence, in robotics, uh, in uh, the development of computer technologies. All of that too is gonna to be taken to the moon with us. That's why I, titled this Taking Silicon Valley to the Moon, because those kind of developments uh, in information technology over the last 50 years really play a key role in enhancing our ability to do exploration and science. So we don't talk about going back to the moon because going back to the moon would, would infer that we're just gonna go and do what we did during Apollo. I like to talk about this as going forward to the moon, as you see in the little logo at the top. This is in fact, is the title of our new planetarium show that uh, we were talking about a few minutes ago before we, uh, we get started. I'll be showing you a few clips from that uh, NASA funded uh, planetarium show. So let's talk about going back to the moon, but one thing we don't want to lose sight of that was very important during Apollo, and that is the inspiration for the next generation. This is a picture of my grandson, uh, Jackson. And uh, of course, you know, we proud grandparents have to show pictures of our grandchildren. And Jackson is in his uh, Apollo spacesuit here. But the, the point being that this generation, like our generation, you know, when I was growing up in the 50s and 60s, that um, the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo programs were really key to get me excited about going into space science research and astronomy and astrophysics. The same is true now I find with my students and my children and grandchildren. And we don't wanna lose that. The elements associated with going forward to the moon with the new 
space program needs to, at its heart, continue to inspire that next generation. So this is the new moon program. It's called Project Artemis. Um, and uh, those of you who might know a little bit of Greek mythology might recall that Artemis is the twin sister of Apollo. So it's a, it's a natural. And NASA has also pledged that uh, on these new missions to the moon, we're going to bring the first uh, woman to the moon, the first person of color uh, to the moon as well in some of those early missions. So um, it's going to, once again, this is reflective of how different the program will be today versus in the 1960s and 1970s. We had a NASA, if you look at those pictures of NASA control room in those days, it was all a bunch of white guys with white short sleeve shirts and these string ties. Um, so things are, are gonna be much different. And here in this, this uh, picture from NASA, you can see two elements of um, Artemis. One at the top here, this swish going across is the human program. It down on the surface is a science program made up of uh, robotic vehicles. Both of them are getting started at about the same time. At the top here, you see the Orion spacecraft that I'll be showing you some more pictures of. Orion was built right here in Colorado, um, not too far from where, from where I am, uh, by Lockheed Martin. Uh, and then the rocket called the Space Launch System, which is even um, more impressive than the, um, the uh, Apollo uh, space rocket, uh, is uh, built by both. And our very first mission, Artemis 1, uh, to the moon, which will not have a crew aboard because it's testing the systems, is going to launch just in the next couple months, probably uh, April or early May. This is Artemis 1 that's referred to here. It actually goes to the moon, goes uh, in orbit of the moon, stays there for about a month, tests out the systems, and uh, comes back. Artemis 2 will be a first mission with uh, humans. It won't land, but it will take um, human astronauts, uh, astronauts around the moon. Uh, and then finally, over here on the end, you see Artemis 3. That will be the first landing uh, of astronauts in the 21st century uh, onto the surface of the moon. And that's expected to be uh, the middle of the decade. So at the same time, NASA, and this is also what's different from the 1960s, NASA is gearing up a very vigorous science program uh, that is made up of these robotic landings. This, uh, what a program called Commercial Lunar Payload Services. Um, and this is this one of these public-private partnerships I was, uh, that, that Joe was just referring to a few minutes ago in the introduction, in which what NASA is doing is it's buying services, not buying the spacecraft, but services from about a dozen companies to take uh, NASA funded payloads, telescopes, other instruments to the surface of the moon. Uh, and those companies are fully responsible for the launch uh, and the landing and even uh, some of the general operations. So the very first of these CLIPS, Commercial Lunar Payload Services, um, is going to be also in just a few months, by the middle of this year. And I have a radio astronomy telescope uh, on board that very first CLIPS mission that I'll tell you a little bit more about in just a few minutes. We're excited to see that uh, begin. So let me, let me show you a little bit more about this next generation of launch vehicle, Orion and the Space Launch System. And here I'm gonna show you a little clip from um, our planetarium show that I mentioned. So it has this strange circular shape and that's because it's really meant to be on a dome. So um, as I mentioned a little bit ago, I'm hoping that you all be able to journey up to the planetarium in Concord there and see this show after um, we get it out to all the planetariums in April. So here's just a little clip. With everything in place, it'll be time to start a new chapter in our history. 
for the Artemis 3 mission to take humans to the moon's surface. After those first astronauts have proven this new route to the moon, what will we make of this opportunity? How might a moon base camp look years after we return to the lunar surface? There may be large structures for mining facilities, geological research, and transportation networks for materials and inhabitants. The materials and resources found on the moon will also be important for sustained exploration of the lunar surface. Astronauts will periodically venture out on the surface in spacesuits, their own personal spacecraft. On the moon, there are many dangers. The vacuum of space, drastic temperature changes, abrasive moon dust, and space radiation are just some of the challenges. So, for much of their stay, Astronauts will be protected inside habitats underneath the lunar regolith. It's safer below the surface of the moon. From here, they will use telerobotics to control robots up on the lunar surface. It's also safer. So that's just a little clip of it. Um, you, uh, some of you might have recognized that um, here on our film, we were able to hire a professional narrator. Uh, Carrie Byram, who uh, was um, involved with the Myth Mythbusters show um, a few years ago. Uh, hopefully, you all were able to see the, uh, the video and the audio. Joe, can you let me know? Did that come across okay? It yes, did. it was good. Okay, great. Just checking. All right. So, how is this different than? Um, than Apollo. Here is a comparison of the Apollo capsule on the left and the new Orion capsule. At first glance, it, it actually looks very similar. Uh, and that's because the physics of re-entry hasn't changed. That is, these spacecraft are coming back from the moon at 25,000 miles per hour, entering into the atmosphere. And in order to safely get the astronauts back, the best shape is still a cone shape with a heat shield underneath that um, is, uh, is called an ablative heat shield that is able to um, absorb the heat and get the astronauts. So, you know, in 50 years, the physics hasn't changed. So that's why the shape, but everything else is different. Uh, how it's powered, uh, for example, um, using solar power with the Orion uh, versus fuel cells, which some of you might remember the explosion of the fuel cells on Apollo 13. So this is safer. We can bring four crew members for, to the moon versus three uh, with Apollo. And the interior, all new electronics and avionics, which is state of the art, it all has those Silicon Valley toys that we talked about, that computer technology uh, that's uh, part of this. So it's a very advanced uh, spacecraft um, although looking similar on the outside. The other thing that's very different about uh, Artemis versus Apollo is there's going to be what NASA has 
called a lunar gateway, a kind of space station, but really more of a spaceship that is going to be permanently in orbit of the moon. Uh, and it's a place where the Orion spacecraft will be able to dock and that the astronauts will move from Orion, which is a reusable vehicle. This will save money. They'll be able to reuse it many times, unlike Apollo, which is thrown away, uh, and come into uh, a small habitat, maybe stay for a day or so, transfer into the lunar lander, which is also going to be reusable, uh, and go to the surface. The uh, Gateway also has this unique power system uh, that is a solar electric power, uh, which NASA is experimenting with. And, hope to use for a mission to Mars someday. So this adds to the flexibility um, that uh, astronauts being able to go to a wide range of places on the surface and actually spend some time uh, in, the, uh, in the gateway as this stopover as well. So let me show you another clip from our planetarium show that talks a bit about this gateway. As astronauts, about five days to reach it, every moment trusting their lives to the hundreds of engineers who designed and built Orion's protective systems. Beyond Earth's magnetic field, the spacecraft will be exposed to the dangers of deep space. Intense radiation and high-speed particles from the sun can damage both electronics and human bodies. Artemis has been designed with these challenges in mind to bring our astronauts safely back to Earth. Artemis is not an end in itself, but just the first step towards a sustainable future in space. For this reason, NASA is leading development of an orbiting spaceport called the Lunar Gateway. The Gateway provides a rendezvous point for landers, cargo, and supplies needed to support operations on the lunar surface and extra living space for visiting astronauts. Constructed by robotic missions in years leading up to the astronauts' arrival, it will be used by both crewed and robotic spacecraft. So again, that shows you a little bit of this new feature of uh, how the Artemis program is different from uh, the Project Apollo. So that's the human slide of the uh, of the equation very exciting that's getting started on the science side that's what i want to spend the rest of my time today talking about it uh, because i'm particularly excited as a radio astronomer to talk about doing radio observations from the far side of the moon on the uh, left image that you see here this is a uh, topographic or topo map of the moon it's like what you see when you pick out a map and look at uh, elevations. So here it's color coded such that uh, purple is low elevations and then red and white are the high elevations. And this is the far side of the moon, the, um, which is not the side you see uh, from the earth. The moon is what we call tidally locked to the earth. That is one side always faces the earth the other side, the far side, always faces away. And that far side is very different and rich in details. For example, you see here this, this uh, low elevation region. This is called the South Pole Aiken Basin. And it's the result of a huge impact by an asteroid over 4 billion years ago. It created the largest, deepest, oldest impact basin in the inner part of the solar system. Um, planetary scientists are eager to get into this region here to bring samples back and help us understand what the moon looked like and, and the earth for that matter very early on. But we radio astronomers are eager to get to this far side as well because it's the only truly radio quiet location in the inner solar system. Uh, and when you're operating at frequencies below the FM band, below about 100 megahertz, this is called the VHF uh, part of the spectrum, uh, you can't do it from the, from the ground because it's too noisy, there's too much radio pollution, 
And also our ionosphere limits the um, radio emission and distorts the radio emission as it's coming through the ionosphere. So for us to be able to study the very early universe, as I'll tell you about in a few minutes, we need to go to a location that is quiet. And this 2,000 miles of rock on the far side that separates those telescopes from the Earth makes for a superbly quiet environment. Here on the right-hand side, you see a picture of uh, one of the uh, landers uh, and uh, components of a radio telescope that is being deployed by robotic rovers that I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, in, uh, in just a few moments. But that just gives you an idea of what's, uh, what's coming out. So we're very excited because the first of our radio telescopes is going to the moon in just a few months. Um, the mission is called, our package rather is called ROLSES, and it has, uh, uh, it's an acronym, uh, a little bit complicated here, radio wave observations at the lunar surface of the photoelectron sheath, okay? What that actually means is these dipole antennas that you see sticking out of the lander here, uh, those are going to do low radio frequency observations that will allow us to measure the uh, ionized gas or plasma that's near the surface that has resulted from the interaction of the solar wind with the, um, with the surface. And so um, that's something that people have wanted to know for some time. Uh, but from the point of view of radio astronomy, it also is going to allow us to study the interaction of that, the radio antennas with the spacecraft and with the subsurface and to measure um, the, the galaxy spectrum um, in details. So this project is led by uh, colleagues at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, uh, myself and a number of other folks who are involved in this. Uh, and it's using the first of these uh, CLIPS landers uh, by a small company, a startup in Houston called Intuitive Machines. Um, and um, we have sent our uh, radio telescope to be integrated into the lander back several months ago. They're finalizing the details, assembling the propulsion tanks and we should be ready to launch in, um, in June. So looking forward to that. That's gonna be followed a few years later by our first radio telescope on the lunar far side. Rolls is actually gonna be on the near side, so it's not able to take advantage of all of the quiet. So where we really are looking forward uh, is this experiment called Lucy, uh, which is gonna be on the far side. Here's a cartoon picture of it. LUCY stands for Lunar Surface Electromagnetics Experiment. Um, and uh, it has these uh, dipole antennas that you see sticking out over here. So very classical, very simple antennas, but in the environment that is radio quiet on the moon, being able to operate at frequencies down to uh, one megahertz or even lower is gonna be you know, a very powerful combination. So this mission is fully funded um, and we're working right now on um, working through the details, building some of the instrumentation. Um, we're, in fact, this week we spent some time uh, working with folks from NASA on the uh, site selection of where on the far side we'd like to put this telescope. It is uh, scheduled to launch in uh, 2025. So those two will be very powerful. Lucy in particular is going to allow us to look at a time in the early universe that has never been explored before. These radio telescopes from the far side are going to allow us to probe the evolution of the early universe in a way that we can't do um, anywhere else. So let me, let me try to illustrate this. This is kind of a busy plot here, but let me draw your attention to the bottom picture. And this is a time evolution of the universe. The Big Bang is over on the left. Today's universe, about 14 billion years later, is on the right. And the time 
um, is shown here in billions of years. So our first baby picture of the universe um, is produced by what's called the cosmic microwave background. And these telescopes, these space telescopes, which would have resulted in several Nobel prizes in physics, I should add, um, have probed this time period. This is when actually the universe is expanded and cooled to the point where electrons and protons can combine together and produce the first hydrogen atoms. At this point on, which is only a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, uh, the universe is filled with neutral hydrogen. But it's dark. Um, there are no stars, no galaxies yet. So astronomers have called it the cosmic dark ages. And it lasts for several hundred million years. This is where we're going to turn our attention um, to a large extent. Uh, and what is happening is there are regions uh, in the early universe that are slightly more dense than others. And they're in the process of collapsing and they form the first stars, which are very massive, 100 times the mass of our sun. And when they turn on, they, they ionize, that is they strip the electron off of the hydrogen atom um, and ionize the gas. And what you see here are um, these ionized bubble, bubbles, which are purple that surround them. As more stars turn on, more of that gas is reionized till finally at about a billion years after the Big Bang, the entire universe, all that hydrogen gas that was out there becomes reionized, okay? So that makes for a very nice story. The problem is we don't have any data to back that up. So even telescopes, powerful telescopes like Hubble and James Webb, which has just arrived recently uh, at its uh, orbit at the Lagrange point between the Earth and the Sun, um, they're only going to be able to stick their toe in the waters of those first stars because those stars are very distant and very faint. But on the other hand, because the universe is filled with neutral hydrogen, we can use our radio telescopes to sample the dark ages and the cosmic dawn in a way that can't be done any other way uh, because the neutral hydrogen emits low radio frequency, uh, radio radiation that we can pick up with our lunar telescopes. So this is gonna be a powerful probe of the uh, early universe and tell us a lot about how the first stars and galaxies form. So that's the game plan, that's the science that we want to do, beginning with Lucy. And then this will continue through to a next project, uh, which is called a FARSIDE. And FARSIDE is an acronym, um, like what you see here uh, that is spelled out. And it's going to do observations, both of the dark ages that we talked about a moment ago, but also exoplanets, that is possibly habitable planets around other stars. So the picture that you see up over here um, is a cartoon picture of a star uh, some, somewhere in our solar neighborhood, but you know, light years away from us. Um, it's called a, a red dwarf. So it's cooler than our sun. And these red dwarfs tend to be very active and they spew out um, emissions, flares, and coronal mass ejections, shocks uh, into the intergalactic medium that then interact with um, the magnetic fields associated with these um, exoplanets. So this project was one that was funded by NASA uh, for us to investigate the initial design. And I'll go into a little bit more detail. We collaborated also with um, the uh, Blue Origin Company, this is Jeff Bezos' uh, space company. Uh, and this is their Blue Moon Lander that will carry um, four of these single axle rovers that will deploy our radio telescope. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But first, let me tell you a little bit about, about the, the science. So we already talked about cosmology in the dark ages. 
let me talk about exoplanets because this is really interesting. This is a unique capability. And what I want to do is draw on our understanding of planets and our own solar system. Uh, and what you're seeing here is a cartoon picture of Mars. This is Mars two uh, billion years ago when we believe it had uh, an ocean of water on its surface. And then Mars today, which is a desert planet, has no water and a thin atmosphere. What happened? Well, the main thing that happened, and that's different than the Earth, is the magnetic field associated with Mars turned off. The core cooled, and that dynamo that was at the center of Mars turned off the magnetic field. And that magnetic field is hugely important in planets like Earth and early on in Mars, and that it protects the planet from the solar wind that you see blowing out of the sun here in this cartoon picture. That solar wind sweeps by the planet, strips the atmosphere, and over the last couple billion years, it has thinned the atmosphere of Mars to the point where it can no longer have the pressure to sustain water. The, the opposite happened on the Earth. Our magnetic field is strong enough to protect us. So the lesson learned here is that when we're investigating other planets in these other solar systems, and we've now identified four or 5,000 uh, planets around other stars uh, in our neighborhood, if we want to ask which ones might be habitable, maybe that we can explore eventually or that may have formed life, not only does it have to have water on the surface, but we think it also has to have a magnetic field in order to protect it. How do we determine if it has a magnetic field? Well, that's going back to our radio telescope because the magnetic field of these planets radiates at low radio frequencies, which we have the sensitivity on our far side array to pick up for the first time. So this is exciting. This will allow us to address one of the great philosophical questions that people have been asking for you know, millennia. That is, are we alone in the universe? Um, and what are the conditions you know, for life to form? So this picture you're seeing here is a, another cartoon of the uh, Blue Origin Blue Moon Lander uh, getting ready to touch down on the moon. And you see our four uh, axle rovers. So we can fit the entire um, array of radio telescopes onto this single lander. It's about 1.5 metric tons that uh, we would take to the surface. And here you see another cartoon uh, picture of the uh, mission architecture. Uh, in which those um, rovers will be lowered uh, to the surface on these tethers. And the tethers uh, then connect the rovers as they go out. Um, and inside the tethers uh, will be the radio telescopes. They'll be just simple wire antennas. And they will be deployed, as you see in the upper left here, uh, over a, a diameter of about 20 uh, sorry, about 10 kilometers uh, in this spiral-like pattern. In total, we'll have 256 of these uh, dipole antennas that we'll be looking at here. So um, we can do that deployment relatively uh, simply. Here just shows you how we pack these rovers, uh, how we plan to pack them on top of the uh, lander here. Uh, they're spring-loaded. Uh, and um, we'll be, <laughs> sorry, my, my cat has decided to, to come and visit. So uh, let me just move him out of the way. No cats on the moon. So we are looking at um, these rover, the, these uh, axle rovers, they're spring loaded. They, when, we're, when we are on the surface, uh, we um, release the springs, they pop out. Uh, and then we lower them to, uh, to the surface. And uh, again, you see another cartoon picture of those then moving. The, um, these tethers have 
the, the radio wire antennas, but they also have power and communications, all of which is relayed back to the central station here, which we then beam to a communication satellite that is in orbit of the moon, uh, and that communication satellite then relays the data back to the Earth. Now, these actual rovers are pretty big. These, these are built and designed by our colleagues at JPL uh, in Pasadena. And this shows you here a uh, picture of one of, the, uh, one of the rovers. And also for scale, you can see here that um, our rover is even bigger than Elon Musk and even bigger than the Elon Musk um, uh, is, is that, that you see here all dressed up and ready to go, even bigger than his ego. So um, it's, um, it's pretty good size. So the spool here has the, the uh, tether uh, and the electronics that are on and also a stereo camera on the axle that will allow us to navigate. We've experimented with this. We've actually built this rover um, at JPL and experimented with deploying these tethers. Let me show you, this is actually up on YouTube, uh, show you um, a video of that. So um, here we go, it's gonna repeat here. So you can see this is sped up, um, but you can see the tether, this is a polyamide, film tether, which is being deployed over here, uh, being all teleoperated, um, you know, aside from the, uh, the rover, um, and give you some idea of what we would like to do um, on, the, uh, on the moon. So we have further experimented with this um, actually in space. And so we did an experiment from the International Space Station uh, several years ago in which uh, my students and I used uh, this K-10 rover at the NASA Ames Research Center in uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, we built a deployer for this polyamide film. Uh, and my colleagues uh, at NASA Ames built this interface, which if you look carefully, you can actually see this is a video in the upper right. And this is Italian astronaut Luca Parmentano remotely operating this rover from the space station. Uh, and you can see that he's looking at a hazard map of, uh, so he can steer the antenna uh, and uh, some still photographs as well. This is the first time that an astronaut in space directly controlled a rover on a planetary surface. Now, of course, that planetary surface is Earth, but you know, you, you get the idea that the, the conditions are the same. We can do this from the space station on the Earth. We can do it from the lunar gateway and um, on the surface of the moon as well. So uh, we got a nice award from NASA for uh, this uh, particular demonstration project that, uh, that we did a few years ago. So that was fun. Now, this, let me also say that this technology that we're developing for what's called tele-robotics, that is to, to uh, remotely operate a rover, this is wonderful for uh, student projects as well. And I wanna show you some work that my students here, these are all undergraduate students at the University of Colorado have done recently in um, designing um, a rover and mechanical arm for the deployment of elements of radio telescope, and then put all of this into a virtual reality environment that um, we could simulate as well. So let me, let me play their video here um, that they presented at a conference uh, this last summer. And I'll go ahead and narrate as it comes up. So this is our rover, we call it Armstrong. Uh, is the nickname, and you can see the arm over here, the stereo camera, uh, and the basic chassis. Uh, and it's operated very simply by an Xbox controller. So uh, the components were bought off the shelf, and then we refined them and the software. We then uh, did a 
uh, CAD model engineering um, representation of the components. Uh, and um, we're able to then rebuild this into uh, the computer environment. We also added a, um, a headset that allows us to control with a three-dimensional representation. Here you can see one of my students as moving his head around, the camera on the rover moves around. So this is a way that the astronauts, rather than just using a flat panel screen, can have more depth perception uh, and intrigue. So the digital version of digital twin, my students got carried away and decided to put it in space here to represent it. This, this is, to show you how accurate, this is the digital version um, that we have and we're able to control it in the same way. And very powerful, put that same digital version onto a um, synthetic uh, version of the moon, learn to drive it around, uh, and to deploy our elements of our radio telescope and learn how to repair things in the same way. So this is a way with the, this digital environment to do uh, rapid prototyping uh, and problem solving. So these undergraduate students are learning a great deal um, in this process. All right, so I've talked about a first array on the moon, but that's not the end of the story. There's more that we want to do. And we were funded recently to develop an engineering design for the ultimate array that we would like to have on the far side of the moon, which we're calling Farview, 100,000 dollars And to add to that, uh, working with a, a small company uh, called Lunar Resources in Houston, that we're actually gonna manufacture the antennas on the moon using lunar soil or lunar regolith. So here's a video that we put together that uh, gives you an overview of this project and what we've done so far. Farview is a next generation astrophysics radio observatory built on the moon's far side. The only radio quiet place within the inner solar system to study the earliest stages of evolution of the universe. The Lunar Observatory will be built from lunar resources and constructed directly on the surface of the moon using space industrial equipment sent from Earth. The required materials will be extracted by lunar resources manufacturing technologies from the lunar regolith. A truck rover then delivers the extracted raw metals to the construction site for the fabrication of antenna elements, solar cells, electrical transmission cables, and batteries. The observatory's antenna array and power grid is then assembled directly onto the surface of the moon, utilizing Lunar Resources space manufacturing technologies and its partners, Intelligent Lunar Rovers. Farview is estimated to be a 10 by 10 kilometer observatory with 100,000 dipole antennas and will take less than four years to be constructed. The Lunar Observatory will explore the origins of the first structures in the universe, opening new science windows into low-frequency radio astronomy, seeking to uncover new physics and test standard cosmological models, and enable new science in heliophysics and planetary science. Farview will be one of the most powerful radio observatories for learning about our universe. So hopefully you see from what I've talked about so far, that there is an evolution, uh, a, a master plan, if you will, for getting radio astronomy going from the moon. We start off very simply in June with our first single dipole antennas landed on the near side. That's followed a few years later by LUCY, uh, which is our first far side uh, radio telescope that will do cosmological exploration. Then uh, later this decade, um, our plan is to build far side the first radio telescope array um, that will look at um, both the early universe and also um, exoplanets. And then finally, in the 2030s, Farview, which will allow us to probe more deeply into the early universe than we've done before. All of this speaks to the idea that unlike Apollo, that the 
program of exploration and science that we're talking about uh, is meant to be sustainable. It's not just flags and footsteps and then you wave and go, go back home and wait another 50 years. This is ongoing development, ongoing development um, in many ways of what we learn on the moon to mine uh, water, manufacture materials, land spacecraft can then be applied to going to Mars, which is much, much harder because Mars is about an eight month journey. Once you're there, you have to spend a year uh, and you're gonna have to learn to live off the surface right away and then another eight months to come back. So it is much tougher than a three to five day journey to the moon. So the way to make it all sustainable though, is to have both the short and the long-term vision. Um, and going forward. And that is in fact where we are. So the first step is going forward to the moon. So with that, Joe, I'm going to stop and uh, be happy to field questions uh, that folks might have at this point. Anybody have questions? I'm sure we do. And we actually have one from Steve in the chat. Um, it says, does Rolls also help you measure some of the locally produced RFI in the under 30 megahertz range due to these interactions so you can better understand and filter out that RFI in your far side radio astronomy efforts? Oh, clever. Yes, yeah, Steve, that's a great question. Um, absolutely. That's one of our goals. Um, you know, we've had uh, some spacecraft back in the 1970s actually go around the moon and uh, sample the radio frequency environment of the, of the moon, but it's been a long time. Um, it's been, you know, 50 years. So with Rolls is one of the things you wanna do is understand the nature of the radio frequency interference, what frequencies it covers, can we filter some of that out um, and uh, maybe even do some useful science, astronomical science, from the near side. That's part of what we want to investigate. The far side, we don't have to worry about that RFI. It just simply isn't there. But you'd have, I mean, if you have that RFI, I mean, you said, you mentioned that the RFI is based on, on ion, you know, some, some interactions with the surface, right? Well, the RFI that you see at the moon is mainly comes from human emissions. Okay. Uh, right, that's what from I mean. the break through the ionosphere. So radio, TV, as well as satellites that are in Earth orbit. So um, on the moon itself, there's not enough of an ionosphere to create the kind of havoc that um, we experience at low radio frequencies on the Earth. Okay, so I misunderstood. I thought there was something, some interaction with the surface or something like that. that yeah, that, uh, but your point is still a good one, that, that, that understanding the nature of the radio frequency interference from the Earth is 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 of interest and important. I'm one of a number of hams in the club, so uh, so yeah. we're you know some interest in that in radio astronomy. So very good. Uh, Gardner has a question: How will the human lander be refueled? Ah, yeah, very good question. So. Um, one of the things I didn't have a chance to talk about, but I was hoping to get a question, and this, this does it, is that in the last um, decade, decade and a half, water ice has been discovered at the poles of the moon. Uh, and so one of the things that NASA is gonna be doing in the next few years is sending a mission to the lunar south pole called Viper. Uh, and it's looking to explore uh, and investigate uh, the nature of that water ice. In principle, you can create rocket fuel because ro what is rocket fuel? It's liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen. You bring them together, boom, they explode. All right, so in that's, by the way, that's not how we make rocket fuel on the earth, but you know, the principle, the principle is there. You separate the water into hydrogen and oxygen. You can then recombine it to make rocket fuel and refuel um, the uh, reusable lander. Oh, very good. Uh, Steve has a question, a different Steve. Can you remind us of the physics of the transitions that produce the radio frequency emissions from neutral hydrogen 
as well as from magnetic fields. And Steve adds, what is the spatial resolution of the far side? Yeah, so you got a, a number of very good questions. So let me delve in. We got to do a little physics now. So everybody hang on. So we'll do a little bit of physics. So uh, neutral hydrogen has what's called a hyperfine transition uh, in the ground state. When you have um, the electron and the proton, they both have spins. Um, and when the uh, spins are parallel, that's the upper state. When they're anti-parallel, that's the lower state. And when it makes a transition, it produces radio emission in the laboratory, in the rest frame at a wavelength of 21 centimeters. So, you know, yay big. But what happens is because of the redshift that is the expanding universe, as that signal goes from those regions that first started the dark ages and gets to us, the expanding universe stretches the wavelength out. So by the time we get it on the moon, it's tens to even hundreds of meters, which corresponds to low radio frequency. So we take advantage of this well-known 21 centimeter line of neutral hydrogen um, to do it, okay? Now, in the case of the, um, the magnetospheres, um, there's something called maser emission. And that is what happens is you get electrons that are trapped in the magnetic fields. And as they get accelerated, they spiral around the magnetic fields uh, and they emit cyclotron radiation, cyclotron maser emission, as it's called. And that's at low radio frequency. The Earth does that. The Earth, for example, uh, in fact, we first saw it from the moon, something called the auroral kilometric radiation. Kilometer refers to the wavelength. Uh, that's how long it is. So it's, it's below a megahertz. Um, and so all planets have this auroral emission. And we've detected this low frequency auroral emission from all the planets um, in our solar system. So it's a well-defined technique. And so um, we can then predict what that magnetic field strength should look like for some of these exoplanets and therefore what the emission and what frequencies to look for uh, with our far side array. So Steve, is that answer those two questions? I'm not sure if you can respond to us or not. I had a quick question. Um, while you're observing from the far side, uh, what is your tracking on that going to be? I mean, I know the moon rotates fairly slowly, but how do you account for that? Yeah, the, the nice thing about these arrays, for example, they're perfectly stationary, they just lie on the, on the ground. And we um, use electronic phasing to um, actually look at the entire sky uh, at the same time. So the sky will just drift over slowly, same way it does on the Earth. As the Earth turns, the sky drifts, and we do what's called a drift scan. And so we'll do the same thing um, from the moon. So nothing moves. Um, which is particularly nice and uh, pointed. So what's the spatial resolution I see here? So the spatial resolution of far side is modest. It's about an arc minute or so, but for both cosmology and for locating um, the exoplanets that are producing this auroral radiation, that's sufficient for what we need. And if we put more antennas, and have them further out, um, it's like a zoom lens that increases our resolution. So eventually we'll look at putting outrigger antennas out there. So, so they'll be phased together, be all connected at some point? Yeah, it's called an interferometer. Uh, and we've been doing radio interferometry on the Earth since the 1950s. Probably the best known example is the very large array radio telescope in New Mexico. Any other questions for Jack? Yeah, Jack, um, I read that the Artemis 1 mission 
sending the uncrewed uh, up to test out the space launch system was going to happen next month. Is that a little premature? Yeah, it's been postponed just recently. This last week it's been postponed. You know, they're being very, very careful because, I mean, this thing is extremely expensive. I mean, this, you know, there, there's close to $100, $100 billion now over the last decade has gone into building Artemis and the SLS. So they want to make sure it doesn't blow up on the pad, that it gets off and does its thing. In the same way, they were very careful with the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, it took a long time. There was extra money. But at least so far, it has performed flawlessly. And we're hoping the same thing for the Artemis One launch. So they're being very careful. You mentioned some things they're going to be, they're going to try to manufacture some things um, on the moon. And, um, and I wasn't quite clear what kinds of things, I mean, the radials are part of that? or, or Yeah, for the, the dipole antennas, the wire antennas uh, that you saw there on that last video. So um, they're made of aluminum. So the moon is rich in magnesium and aluminum. So we will gather up a lunar regolith and use an electrolysis process to separate out the, um, uh, the aluminum um, and that process usually requires a high vacuum, which is done in vacuum chambers on the Earth. Of course, the moon is a great vacuum. So it's, it's better than any vacuum that we have on the Earth. Uh, so it's the perfect environment for this type of molten um, regolith electrolysis, as it's, as it's called. So we'll then plate these very thin wire antennas onto the surface of the moon. We've already done that in the lab. So this technology has been demonstrated in the lab. Uh, and also uh, my partner company, Lunar Resources, uh, we're going to be demonstrating that in space uh, with a, a mission funded by the DOD um, in the next year and a half, I think. Um, and then we'll be taking it to the moon to experiment. Okay. Question from, from Shale. Uh, how much battery storage do you need to charge and store power for telescope operations during the lunar night? Oh, that's a great question. That's an absolutely fantastic question because this is tough operating from the moon at night because um, you realize that given the orientation of the moon, that there's two weeks of day and two weeks of night. So no matter where you are in the moon, whether you're on the near side or the far side, is, the far side is not the dark side. As, as people, people sometimes confuse because the, the, the far side gets as much light as the near side does. Uh, but the temperature variation is extreme. So at noon on the near side, sorry, on, noon on the uh, day side, uh, it is uh, up to 100 degrees Celsius. So the equivalent temperature of boiling water. On the night side, it gets down to minus, um, let's see if I get this right, minus 170 Celsius. So a 270 degree temperature swing. So just think about that for a moment. What does that do to electronics? What does that do to materials? Um, that's, that's a tough environment. So for Lucy, one of the things that we're doing with Lucy is we are also going to operate at during the night for the first time. This will be the first instrument. And in order to do that, we're bringing 70 kilograms worth of batteries to the surface, okay? That will allow us to operate during the night. And then uh, when day breaks, uh, we'll have solar panels that will recharge the batteries and we'll be able to do it again. So the Rolls' mission is only gonna last for one lunar day about 10 to 12 days. Uh, but Lucy, we're looking for it to last several years uh, on the surface with the batteries. Now, that is not a good long-term solution. The long-term solution is to um, uh, develop uh, solar power farms and batteries uh, and uh, maybe small nuclear reactors 
that are very compact now. The Department of Defense and the Department of Energy have developed these small um, uh, fission reactors that could be brought to the moon and provide uh, kilowatts worth of power. So I think that's where we'll be going by the end of the decade. So this is a start, uh, but the batteries are really heavy, really heavy. All right, one, one more question, kind of technical. How do you address the different antenna elements? Common bus with addressing or separate cables? Yeah, so the cable, the, the tether that you saw um, connects all of the antennas along one of the arms. So what we do is we record the voltages on each one individually and multiplex those back to our central station. And we have a computer on board the uh, lander that will then do a correlation of those signals. So each one of these voltages will also be time tagged so we know you know, when the signals would come in and allow us to then process and send those initially correlated data back to the Earth. Cool. Um, any final questions for Jack? Yeah, I know you guys got, got a business meeting to <laughs> attend to here, so you got real business to do. Jack, I've, I've enjoyed this. This, this was really, really cool. This, Thank you, thank you very much for joining us. And, and and I have to say, so far I've been lucky in getting good speakers. So thank you very much. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure. Enjoyed it. Thank you. You guys, and and my uh, my fee for this is send me a lobster roll in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> we'll figure thank out you a very way. Very much. It's figure fun. out a way. All right. We'll see you all. Thank you, Jack. Thank you very much. Good night.